G'day everyone. In this second video of week five of our admin law course, we're continuing our discussion of the hearing rule of natural justice. So far, we've learned that natural justice is the idea that when someone with public power is making a decision that affects you and your life, you should be entitled to be heard in relation to that decision, and you should be entitled to an unbiased decision maker. Now, we know from previous weeks that natural justice applies to a decision of an administrative character made under an enactment. When it comes to natural justice, though, we have to take this one step further because we need to ask who is entitled to natural justice? Put yourself in the position of a public servant about to make a decision on a development application to build a new childcare centre in a country town. Who should be consulted in relation to this decision? We know it's a decision of an administrative character made under an enactment, but who should be given the opportunity to have their say about the decision? The developers, obviously, but also perhaps the neighbours who will be affected by an increased amount of traffic or the operators of other childcare centres? I mean, for any decision, there may be a range of people who feel that their voice ought to be heard. The rule comes from Kiowa and West, a case that we've already met. This was the one with the Tongan family who overstayed their visa to avoid the cyclone. In that case, Justice Mason said, it is a fundamental rule of the common law doctrine of natural justice, expressed in traditional terms, that generally speaking, when an order is to be made which will deprive a person of some right or interest, or the legitimate expectation of a benefit, he is entitled to know the case sought to be made against him and to be given an opportunity of replying to it. So from this, we get the key term rights, interests, and legitimate expectations. If a decision will potentially deprive you of a right, an interest, or a legitimate expectation, then you will be entitled to natural justice. The idea of rights and interests is fairly straightforward in the context of admin law. If prior to a decision you have certain rights and the decision affects those rights, then you're entitled to natural justice. So if you have a license from the government to do something like drive a car, that gives you a right, the right to drive a car. A decision which would take that right away would be a decision affecting your rights. Interests is a similar but slightly broader term. You have an interest in something if you have a stake in it. So, for example, you have an interest in your personal reputation. You have an interest in your ownership of goods. In a case called Annitz and McCann, the parents of a deceased teenager were held to have an interest in his reputation and in knowing the circumstances of his death. If the government decides to take away some right or some interest, then ordinarily we would expect you to be entitled to natural justice. There's only one hiccup here, and that is that the decision has to affect you personally and directly. Remember, administrative decisions are about applying rules, not about making them. If the government changes rules, and that rule change just happens to affect you, that doesn't mean you're entitled to natural justice. That sounds odd and confusing until I explain it with an example. Let's say that after reviewing the road accident figures across a 10 year period, the government decided that young men were not going to be allowed to obtain their driver's licenses until age 20. And let's say that the impact of this was going to be a reduction in road deaths of 200 per year, and a reduction of crashes overall by 10,000. Let's say the government also identified that single vehicle car crashes were the most common form of suicide among young men. So the outcome is, if you're a young woman, you get your license at 17, as per the current system, but if you're a young man, you get your license at 20. And if, at the time the law begins, you're a 19-year-old man with a license, well, you lose your license until you turn 20. Now that 19 year old young man has certainly had his rights and interests affected by that decision, hasn't he? 
But can you see that nobody was making a decision about him personally? All they did was to make a rule of general application. The government couldn't be expected to go around and offer procedural fairness in that case to every young man under 20 in Australia, could they? It would be impossible and ridiculous. Instead, we have a parliament where the whole community is, at least theoretically, represented in order to have their views heard. So individuals don't have a right to procedural fairness when the decision isn't about them personally, but rather is a rulemaking decision. In Kiara and West, Justice Mason put it this way, many decisions do not affect the rights, interests and expectations of the individual citizen in a direct and immediate way. Thus, a decision to impose a rate or a decision to impose a general charge for services to ratepayers, each of which indirectly affects the rights, interests or expectations of citizens generally, does not attract this duty to act fairly. As long as you keep that one exception in mind, though, rights and interests are not too hard to understand. Legitimate expectations are quite a bit trickier. You have a legitimate expectation when you don't have a right or an interest yet, but you're expecting to have one. I reckon the best way to understand legitimate expectations is to think about the tooth fairy. Stop laughing and bear with me here. If you're a seven or eight year old kid and you've just lost a tooth, then you know what's going to happen that night. You're going to put the tooth under the pillow or in a glass beside the bed and the tooth fairy is going to come and exchange that tooth for some money. When I was a kid, it was 50 cents. My own kids got five bucks. I imagine their kids will be hitting the tooth fairy up for 50. Now, nobody promises the kid anything. They don't have a contract. They don't have a right to any money. But in the natural course of things, they know it's coming. They can start planning how to spend it from the moment the tooth comes out. It's a legitimate expectation that they will get money from the tooth fairy. See how it works? A legitimate expectation is about rights and interests that you don't have yet, but which you're expecting to have in the future. If you have a legitimate expectation and an administrative decision affects that expectation, then you may be entitled to natural justice. Let's look at some examples. We'll start with FAI Insurance and Winnikey. FAI was a major Australian insurer, which was then swallowed up by a larger insurer, HIH, which in turn crashed and burned in the great insurance crisis of the late 1990s and early 2000s. During the 1960s and 70s, FAI was a major provider of workers' compensation insurance in Victoria. Its licence was coming up for renewal, and it would have been typically expected uh, that the renewal would have just been a matter of form and that if there were any concerns about the renewal, the government would speak to FAI first. So you can see, FAI didn't have any rights beyond the expiry of their current licence, but they had the legitimate expectation of a renewal of that licence. As you can probably guess, the Victorian government did not renew the licence. They were concerned about the cash reserves held by FAI. The High Court found that FAI did have a legitimate expectation, and so the hearing rule should have applied. They should have been given a chance to show that their management of their insurance obligations was adequate. They should have had a chance to answer the government's concerns. Another basis for a legitimate expectation might be the existence of international agreements. It is reasonable to expect that the Australian government will act in a way that complies with international agreements which Australia has signed or ratified, even if those agreements have not specifically been made into law. So in Minister for Immigration Against Teo, Mr Teo was convicted for possessing heroin and a deportation order was made. However, his children and stepchildren were not deported. Australia was, and is, a party to the International Covenant on the Rights of the Child. And that covenant requires that the child's best interests must be considered when administrative decisions are made which affect the child. Deporting a child's father certainly affects the child. The High Court agreed that the Immigration Department should have given Mr Teo 
the opportunity to make arguments about whether his deportation was consistent with Australia's obligations under the Covenant. Finally, legitimate expectations can arise from a standard governmental process or for, from the government's statements about its processes. So in a case called Houcher and the Minister for Immigration, the Minister had made public statements that he would only overturn immigration decisions of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal in exceptional circumstances when strong evidence could be brought forward to justify doing so. The Administrative Appeals Tribunal made a decision in Mr Houch's favour, but the Minister overturned that decision. The High Court found that the Minister's statement had created a legitimate expectation, and so before overturning the Tribunal's decision, the Minister should have given Mr Houcher the opportunity to be heard as to whether there were any exceptional circumstances or whether there was any strong evidence. Now, these are not the only circumstances in which a legitimate expectation may exist. There may be circumstances which will justify a person legitimately expecting that a decision will not be made without them having the benefit of the hearing rule. But it must be an expectation, not merely a hope. And there must be a clear basis for relying on that expectation. So, for instance, in South Australia against O'Shea, a prisoner was recommended for parole by the parole board, but then his parole was rejected by the governor on the advice of the minister. The High Court found that he merely had a hope of parole, not a legitimate expectation of parole. The decision of the parole board did not provide a basis to expect that the minister would form the same view. Similarly, in Country Energy against Williams, an Aboriginal man's expectations that he would be permitted to undertake extensive inspections to look for Aboriginal artefacts on an area of land prior to the building of power lines, that was held to be a hope rather than a legitimate expectation. It seems that there will be a question of fact before the court as to whether a person's expectations cross the threshold from being a mere hope to being an actual expectation. So where are we at with natural justice? We know there's this thing called the hearing rule, which says that a person has a right to be heard in relation to a decision that affects them. We know that this only counts for decisions of an administrative nature, which are made directly under an enactment, using powers granted by that enactment. Now in this video, we know that to get natural justice, to get that right to be heard, the decision needs to affect your rights, interests, or legitimate expectations. It has to affect those rights, interests, and legitimate expectations directly. So rulemaking is different from decision-making. And legitimate expectations have to have some basis. Mere hope is not enough. Let's say you've gotten over all these hurdles. Your decision is an interest of an administrative nature it's made under an enactment, and it does affect your rights, interests, and legitimate expectations. What does the hearing rule actually look like in action? What rights does it actually give you? That's our next question. See you in the next video.